Hello, everyone. I'm going to have a small introduction to Apache Lucene and from a perspective of uh, Java enterprise developers. And to quickly introduce myself, I work for Red Hat. That's why I'm standing at this. I'm a principal software engineer working in research and development. Higher, OK. I'm Dutch and Italian, but I'm living in London now. And I work on the Hibernate team. So I'm uh, leading the Hibernate search project. I also work on Hibernate ORM, of course, and Hibernate OGM, which is our new uh, object data grid mapper. And uh, I contribute to Infinispan, where I am the Lucene guy in the team. So I have worked on Infinispan query, the Infinispan Lucene directory, and extensions for Hibernate search. And if you don't know what these are, don't worry. We're going to look at all these components during the presentation. Uh, I help also with the Whitefly team, I contributed to J groups, and of course I help with Apache Lucene itself. So, what are we going to discuss here? Well, the, we start with seeing well, what, what Apache Lucene is and what, what it can do for you. Um, I've, uh, I'm going to look at it from a perspective of uh, JPA applications, so from a point of view of uh, Hibernate development, but not only. And uh, so it integrates also with uh, Infinispan and how this works when you're deploying an application server like Whitefly. We're going to see what it means to have to manage uh, indexes and uh, what we're planning to do in the near future and what we're already working on. So to get really straight on to the jugular of the problem, you see, if you are interacting with uh, databases or relational databases, mostly what the JPA uh, uh, the, the standard is meant to address. You, um, you're, you're working with a relational database, and you, you'll get problems like this. Like if uh, if you go to the website of Java One and you could not remember where your next talk is, you cannot. I mean, the website will could ask you what's the primary key of the document that I have to serve you. Uh, this is the kind of interaction that you have with JPA and with a relational database, but it, it really doesn't work when you have a human interaction because it goes by, by terms. So if you look at successful websites like Amazon, of course, it's not going to ask you what's the primary ID of the item that you want to buy today. You'll, you'll have a general idea which is meant by, by keywords, concepts, uh, maybe a synonym of what's in the, in the site, and you will not spell it exactly like the, the system is expecting. So there is a, a guessing work which is made by the IT system of the, of the company. So what do we have in standards? Well, SQL has the like operator, which is like the closest thing that you can have to, to implement something like, like this. The problem is, um, let, let's say you are searching something in the Wikipedia, and you have a full SQL console which gives you access to the Wikipedia itself. Are you going to write a query like this in which you have to basically put this, add a snippet of the exact content which is in the document that you're looking for? You would need to quote it. Or maybe you would need to quote the exact title. But if you don't know exactly the content or how it's written or which style it is written, you will never find anything using a like operator. Mm. You can make it a bit more complex. So many databases uh, will, uh, you know, when you're interacting with a system like this, you might try to work around it like, OK, but let's consider just the lowercase of a single term, which might be contained in the document that I'm looking for. But still, this is getting something which is extremely uh, expensive to compute for the database, and uh, not at all what you're actually wanting out of your system. Again, this is not how successful systems are implemented. And imagine how it would work, like companies like this, if they were implementing it using a SQL operator like, which you would never have the, the, the power of information that we are having today. So um, other examples, like is, is there any, um, from, from all the successful web companies that you know, is there anyone which is not having a very powerful text input. You'll, um, sorry, again, again. The, the problem is really with uh, human interaction. So if you're dealing with a database and are integrating different IT systems, you might be totally fine using foreign keys, uh, you know, published codes, which are uh, the, the, the public ID of some object. 
and using those, you can integrate different systems. But when it comes to human interaction, so a human needs to search something or wants to get some information out of the system, the traditional technologies that we have, like in the Java Persistence API, they will never be fit for this technology, for this purpose. So um, the thing is, you really want to guess what, is, what, what the user is needing. And you have some hints out of it. You cannot ask him uh, to fill in a full form because we, we all hate that. Like it's, uh, it's this thing. And we also want this information to be delivered to us very, very quickly. It's, uh, we are getting used to it. Like everybody's using Google. You type something, you have an immediate response from the website. So uh, why can we not build the same with our application? Does it be, has it to be slow or has it to be inaccurate? Finally, what you really want is you want to guess exactly what a user is looking for, and that result has to be on the top of your results. So that's what we call relevance in this field. And uh, it is, uh, it's actually quite simple to deliver if you have the right tools for this. So yeah, again, relevance, what does it mean? If I'm searching for something, the first things that I'm looking for need to be on the top of the system. Uh, we all know that people are not going to look at uh, the full page of the Google result or even the second page. That's if you, if you are there, you are out. This is now well known in marketing, but it works with any of your uh, human interaction. So you have to consider several aspects of this. So you want to match on uh, approximate matches of words. So you don't just want to match on a term which has to be exactly how it's stored in your database, but it might be might have some typos in there. And uh, you want to be able to use stemming. So stemming means that you are going for the root of the same word, which means you're having the same semantic identity of the word, but it's not being written exactly in the same time or same declination that you have in the article rather of the human query. And this very often this means that you need uh, language specific processing which varies across of the language of the content itself and you might want to customize all of this if you're writing a medical application and you have uh, acronyms which are specific for the field in which you're working you want to customize this so you don't want to take an off-the-shelf library and say okay you just split all the words on a white space and lowercase things that's not going to deliver the same good result as actually inserting some smartness in your system about knowing how to handle different acronyms, which, uh, which synonyms are actually the same, or, or how to do exactly the stemming in your specific system. So this is to make a uh, very simple example. If I'm looking for, uh, I, I'm querying this on Amazon. I heard of this book, it's called uh, On How to Improve Running, and it's written by some Scott, I don't remember who it is, but so I write a query like this. The system, if you're using uh, Lucene, it's going to tokenize this, and it's going, the first thing it's going to do is, like, if you're using the default tokenizer, because we're talking about a very flexible system here, but let's assume the default system, you're going to split this sentence in different keywords. It's going to be lowercase, so like Scott is going to be just written like Scott. And then it's going to discard particles of the language, which are never useful enough to identify a subset of information which is relevant to you. And then as a second phase, after we have these four tokens, so we also applied some, uh, some stemming, like running became run, improve, became improve, which is like the stem of all the different possibilities that you might have about, you know, I could have written on how to improving uh, something in the query. You still understand what the general meaning is that the user is looking for. And then you go by scoring. Scoring in a situation like this is extremely important because there might be lots of books about running. But like Scott, that is a, a noun, or that's a, a first name of a person. So the, the relevance, uh, the contribution to the overall scoring system of Scott is much higher than, for example, the how term, which will be very, very popular in many titles of many books. So Scott is going to have a, a, an important effect on the scoring formula that we're going to see a bit more later about that. So what is Apache Lucene? 
Well, it's a very popular, extremely popular uh, open source project from the uh, Apache community. It's uh, written primarily in Java, but there are ports in many other languages. And uh, it really is uh, deployed everywhere. I've seen, like, so it, it is a really, truly open source project. So there is no strong branding or strong marketing behind it. But if you look around, even here at Java 1, there are lots of technologies here which have been presented. And then after, under the hood, if you look, they're all embedding Lucene in some form or the other. Like, for example, uh, our, our uh, IDs, they include Lucene so that they can uh, help you with auto-completion of class names, for example, or our issue trackers, they include it. But also you have systems like, you know, well-known well websites like uh, Twitter or LinkedIn, they're all based actually on top of Lucene behind. Mm -hmm. And uh, they do a really, really great work on testing. They're always like the first ones to find the regressions in the JDK builds. Mm -hmm. So how, how do you interact with this as a Java enterprise developer? You know the Java Persistence API, um, but Lucene is so much better to, to resolve this specific problem than what you do using a, uh, you know, a relational query or an HQL query, while it would be in Hibernate or Criteria. So what we are doing here is uh, integrate with JPA, but giving you a different API set to express the new kind of query is which are strongly language focused and uh, they have uh, this concept of scoring and uh, more like a human interaction probability stick world. So what you really want from here is having your application framework to not have to deal with two different representations of your data. So we're all familiar with having, with storing your data over an ORM into the database, but now you will have also Lucene, which is a, a different system, and now you have to deal with two different representations of your data, and you have to query two different things. This is very inconvenient from uh, the point of view of uh, maintenance of a complex application. So what are we doing here? In, uh, in the Hibernate world, we have this integration called Hibernate Search, which is very strongly integrated with the Hibernate uh, ORM, both if you're using the native API or, or if you're using the entity manager from, uh, from Hibernate. And uh, it uses all of the Lucene queries. It gets all of the best performance out of it because I've been doing this since many years and we have very good uh, relations with uh, the rest of the Lucene community. So we keep working on all the tricks and knowing how to map the, in the best way your model into Lucene rather than in a relational database. And we give you some easy to use annotations to define what you want to index it and how you want to index it. But the best part is it's not hiding the Lucene API itself. So we are giving you uh, all the methods which allow you to write Lucene native queries so you can take any of the Lucene ecosystem libraries which build on top of Lucene to do something. And you can run those queries on the index which is being generated by this integration. Now, yeah, the, the strongest part is uh, we will index, uh, so we will update the state of the index based on what you are changing in your transactions. So if you are changing a, a Hibernate entity, a JPA entity, which is annotated with additional annotations like indexes, which is the, the, the primary trigger for Hibernate search to kick in, when you are committing the transaction, this will apply changes both to the database and to the index. So you never have to care about keeping the two different worlds in synchronization but you can then query them in the most fit way depending on what your use case is. If you're doing a relational query, you can go through to the database, or if you're uh, going, or, or if you need a, a full text query, a Lucene query, you can run one on the index directly. Yeah, we integrate with the transactions. And uh, on top of this, since we take out the complexity of dealing with writing the index, we provide uh, many different options to integrate with uh, clustering technology and a failover of this index because the, the catch is, of course, now you have an index to manage. Mm. So how do you get started with this? The, the requirements are, are really, really simple. All you need to do is have the Hibernate Search or M library on your class path as well. And pick one which is compatible with the version of Hibernate that you're using. So it, it strongly integrates with Hibernate. 
So you, you'll just have to edit the class path. That's it in terms of configuration. There are many other additional optional configurations that you can do to do tuning, but with this, you are good to go. The next step is you take an entity. This is the, you know, the simplest entity I could come up. Let's say we have this actor. It has a primary ID and it has a name and we mark it as an entity. So this is a valid JPI entity, right? Now, the first thing is we trigger Hibernate search by saying this is something that we want to index and you'll have to do for me. And then you have to say, yeah, but which fields do you want to index? It's an opt-in strategy. You don't want to index everything which is in your database. You will have some fields which are the ones which want to be searchable by different people, and that's what you, what you choose there. And you're done, essentially. Uh, you can make it a bit more complex uh, if we have like a movie entity which has a relation to many, ent many actors. In this case, we can index this as well and add an index and embedded annotation which implies we are going to traverse the full graph and when our movie is changed or any of its uh, related objects is changed, this will be uh, denormalized, at, uh, like flattened in the index so that you can have both the movie title indexed and the set of actors as part of the same Lucene entry in the index. How does that look like? So if you have two actors, Harrison Ford and Kirsten Dunst, they will be in their own index, the actors index, and you'll have two different lines like this. And then you have a movie index. The movie index is going to look very, very strange. Like you might have a title, but then you have multi-valued fields at, in, in some other fields. Like in this case, this is the representation of the index, how it looks like when you have a many to many simply put in, in the Lucene storage engine, it's not a relational uh, database, so you can have multiple values on the same field. Mm -hmm. And that's how we map it, simply. So how do you query this? Um, again, let, let's say that we are targeting the two fields in the index, the title and the actor's name. So you build a query, a Lucene query. This is the Lucene type package, right? And then you can extract the full type entity manager out of an entity manager at any point in code that you might need that. And you just wrap this. So you create a, a full text query and you have to specify, so which Lucene query do you want to run and which types are you targeting on your index. Out of that, the return type here, this full text query, this is an extension of the JPA query. So it implements set max results, get results list, and you can pass this to any other framework which does like the pagination, the rendering on your sites, and everything It's fully compatible. But the best part is that what you are returning, which is a query that you have uh, defined as a full text query running on the index, it is actually returning transactionally loaded and managed entities out of the database. So any change that you will do subsequently to this list of movies, will be reflected again both in the database and in the index when you commit your transaction. So let's do a very, very basic demo. I just, I'm just going to show a, a very simple code here. So all of this code is on GitHub, by the way, so you will, I, I will put, post some links later. But So this project I've made here is the simplest example I could put together. If we start from the POM XML, well, I just want to show you the sources. You will see I have the Hibernate Search ORM of a specific version and Hibernate Core, and they're all market provided so that if you run it on Wildfly, you don't actually have to bundle any dependencies because they are there already. And I'm also adding a transaction manager because in this test, I'm not running it within the container. And I like JUnit and in memory database so that we can actually run some tests. Now, if we look at entities in here, I have a single entity and I've called it the tweet. So if you want to implement Twitter in uh, four classes, it would look approximately like this. You want tweet entities, you want them to be indexed, and we're going to call the index uh, tweets, and we're going to define an English analyzer. So this analyzer here is going to specialize in uh, 
splitting and breaking down the ing English language so that you get the best results doing query time if you know that the language is, is this. So this is actually, this is, a, this is a simple example of how to define an analyzer. So I'm calling this the English analyzer, but then I'm actually specifying here in a declarative way how I want this analyzer to behave. So the standard tokenizer is the one which is just going to take all the white space and wiping it out, and that's going to create tokens out of the sentence, out of this, the white space. And then we're going to do ACI folding filter, which means all of the accents, the DRZs, they will be folded down in their basic character representation. Next step, we want to lowercase of the this, and then we want to use uh, a stop filter factory, which takes some parameters. So this is to show you the flexibility that you have in how you want to define a chain of language processing. The parameters in this case, it's going to load a resource file, which you can define yourself. So this is a stop list. And yeah, it's a list of fragments of the sentence that I want the system to ignore. Because this will just bloat my index with lots of repetitions of these particles of speech, which are not representative when it comes to do the scoring aspect of, of my system. But of course, here you can store any other custom string that might not make sense in your specific domain model or the specific language that you're targeting. So back to the tweets. The, I'm using getters and setters here, but essentially this is a valid JPA entity again. Right? The special parts are the fields. So this is a field, which means we're going to index the message so that it becomes searchable. We're also going to index the sender, but here we, I specify an option which is called analyze no. Analyzing means apply the analyzers. So you can have a default analyzer for the whole system, and you can override analyzers on a per field or dynamically depending on some attributes. So you could have like a, a, a field in the entity which encodes which language this entity in, and then you can shard on the language code, and you can apply an analyzer which is language specific on the instance. But what happens in this case is I'm basically telling him that the ID, the username of who's tweeting, should not be processed. So even if there are capitals in there or, or if there are accents, I just want to consider this as a single keyword, which is not going to be split in different particles because that might mix up my end. And then, OK, so Lucene does not deal with relations, but it deals very well with times. So. Uh, well, with numbers, sorry. So in this case, we can encode and say that the, get the timestamp of the tweet needs also be indexed in there so that I can add criteria or restrictions out of my query, which are range-based. I could tell him, you know, search by this hashtag, by this person, but only in the last three days. And this would result in an extremely efficient query to run. How does a service look like for this? This is the DSL. Let, let me enlarge that a bit. Oops. So you get the full text entity manager. So this is such a um, simplified demo that I'm not even using uh, injections, right? But here you could just do inject your full text entity manager and inject your query builder. But I, I'm actually having my test hardness set these fields for me. But what you do is get the query builder, and then you go and, OK, this, I want this to make uh, a keyword query on this field, and it has to match this keyword, create a query. And this is the Lucene API. And you can also use the Lucene API itself to create it. I mean, the important point for Hibernate Search is that you create a Lucene query. This is a helper of Hibernate Search, which uh, drives you to do the simple things. But you can use all of the Lucene APIs directly, natively. And the important point is that then you wrap this in a full text query. And this is a JPA query. And similarly, you can search by other components. It, it's not even getting too interesting. So let's see, look at the test directly. In a test, I have a prepare test phase. We have two methods here, a before and a test itself. Okay? It's all very, very simple. So what I do is I, cre I start the entity manager factory as the first step because we're not in a container. I'm not using anything here. And then we create an entity manager. I begin a transaction. Sorry, I've hidden the helpers to, be, to be begin the transactions. But And then you transform the entity manager in a full text entity manager. 
Oh, this is uh, because I always forget to delete my index and then it fills my tests. So I just delete the index straight on from the, the purge all means uh, wipe out the, the index related for this type. I flush it and then we store some tweets. And these are the sentences of the Twitter and of the tweet which is being stored. And this is like the, the username of who's tweeting with the timestamp. So if you assume these sentences are really stored, these are then queries and the tests which we are running. As you can see, get result sides and get result list, they, they are all like, they're all like standard methods. And the thing is, if I'm searching for drools, it's going to give me two results because there are two different sentences here which are mentioning the drools project. But you're getting the same if I write it in a really crazy way because of the language processing which is behind the scenes, right? And essentially, that's it. That, that's that's how, how you use this, this technology. But let's get back to the demo because there is so much more to see about this. Well, I already explained this, you know, the declarative uh, things. And then you have filters. You can specify filters in a, again, you can specify them in a declarative way or you can create your own filters programmatically. These are very efficient to stack different restrictions on top of your other queries. So you could have a query, which could be like the parsing of a user-provided query. But on top of that, you want to add additional things. So if you have a complex form or a simple form, which has an input text, which is the user, but then you have, let's say, let me show me the special offers of the day or, or things like that. These are additional filters which you stack on top of the initial one. And so we could say, well, the, the special offers of the day and the things which are in stock today in San Francisco. So these things, they're all meshed together in bit sets at the Lucene level on the index. So you have the query results and then the filters. The, the best part of this is that filters are reused across multiple queries and they are cached at a very low level. So the performance that you get out of filters, they allow you to narrow down the set of data which is, needs to be processed and reuse it all the time from the system. You also can do like faceting. Faceting is the example here. You're, uh, you go and look for Hibernate search in action on Amazon, and you will see this structure on the left side, which has some statistics. Like it will tell you, okay, but we have like 14 approximate matches in the category of programming, and like four in computer science, and so on. We are all getting very used to this kind of structure because it helps the user, after having typed like the first input to the system, to narrow down in which direction he wants to go. But again, the problem is, how do you do this with a relational query? It's, it's extremely hard. Now, the, the fun aspect is that within the Lucene world, the, Lucene works by statistics and uh, frequency of terms. So knowing the frequency within a category is like a, a lookup in a map. It is an, a very, very cheap operation. And when you're running the query, adding the faceting capabilities is, uh, is pretty cheap. It's, it's not going to add uh, much in your uh, response time of your page loads. So in this case, when you run a query, you can get in a single go out of the index, you will get the list of the results in order of relevance and the breakdown in categories. Of course, the type of result doesn't look like very nice. You will have a list and a map, and you can then navigate the map by facet names and values within there. But you can render that in, in some very nice ways. We implemented recently a more like this implementation. So if you have an entity already, like you have a, an instance of a coffee description, which has several fields, and you want to find from your index all the other coffee descriptions which are similar to the first instance, you can do that. And we just create using the query builder that we have seen. Like uh, in this case, I'm going to say compare all the fields of it, but you could narrow down to specific fields. And you know you have to pass it, of course, the the, in, the example instance. But from there, you create again. You create a full text query which you can run in the system and get again the result ordered by the best matching on top. Mm. And we do special filtering, so you can add restrictions which are locality based. So you can search for a restaurant which has specific keyboards, but not in the whole world. You want to be able to get there in five minutes walking. So that's an additional restriction that you can add on your index. And you can annotate just by longitude or latitude coordinates, or you can implement a coordinate interface. There are many ways to do it. The general point is that you give coordinates 
and a distance restriction maximum from a central point. Now, how do you run this on Wildfly? That's where it, it's actually getting a bit boring and embarrassing. I'll switch to the dif a different test here, a trivial no models test. So this is an Archelian test. So I can do integration testing within the container. And I'm using shrinkwrap to define how the deployment is looking like. Now, in this test, we're going to need some beans. So first thing is we create a web archive with a name. Then I'm adding the entity of my test, an indexed member, and a bean. This is an AGB, which creates members, registers members, and searches for members by name. You see, I'm using the full text queries here again. And what's in resources? I actually forgot. Oh, a simple helper to you know give me the to produce the full text entity manager without having to, to invoke it. And then you need a persistence XML to trigger JPA. And this is the DSL which in Shrinkrub defined a persistence XML file. But as you can imagine, this is just a persistence XML which is pointing to an example data source which you have in Whitefly and sets two configuration properties. I want, since it's an integration test, I wanted to create a database and drop the database when I'm on deploying. And I also want the index to be stored in, uh, in memory because it's a so it's going to be volatile and it's destroyed when, when I'm tearing this down. This is all you need in terms of configuration for a test. And my test is going to you know, inject the bean, create a user, register it, and make sure it was registered. Like, you know, an ID is assigned on storage. So this is testing my bean for storing a new member in the system. And then you can test for search. Let's uh, register this uh, Peter Otol with this phone number. And then you can search for Peter, and you can verify there is one result out of this. And we have seen before, like this search by Peter, this is not using a like operator on, on the name, because that would be extremely boring. We can do much better here. We can do the full text query on top of Lucene. And well, I, I'll just run you to, to, to show you. I'm not lying, but. Oh, about dependencies. Have you noticed that? There are no dependencies at all in here. Because Wildfire already integrates all of what you need to run this. Mm. So the only thing that you need is uh, just start, start using the API, and you get better queries results. Yes, was that green? Green. So here we can see this started a Wildfly 10 server, candidate release 4. We are almost there, releasing Wildfly 10. And then it deployed the application somewhere here. Yeah. Triggering Hibernate core annotations. The member registration bean is, is registered there. And then it ran our tests, of course, here. Undeploys and tear down the container. Yeah. So let's get to the catch. This all look at very simple. You have no new dependencies to store on Wildfly. Oh, I forgot. My test was running on Wildfly, but you can embed the libraries in any other container, or it doesn't need to run in a container. It, the, the only limitation is the, this current version requires specific versions of Hibernate ORM. So when you update one, you'll need to update the other and keep, keep them in sync. Now, the catch is, of course, that now you have an index. And we are all used to have an application server here, which doesn't need any kind of persistent storage, and a database somewhere there, which is tuned by database administrators, and they have powerful I.O. over there. But now you actually have to store this index somewhere as well. And to get the best performance out of the system, you want to store the index on the same nodes of your application server, so that every, node of, uh, every application node has a local index to do a very, very quick and efficient lookup in this index without having to contact other nodes. So there is a catch here. You need to store it. And um, they will be written. Every transaction you do, we are updating the, the index behind the scenes. Now, the good news is we do some really, really good optimizations. We get like in, uh, you can write millions of transactions per second on a poor laptop, not even solid state drive disk. 
because what we do is actually we compensate for latency on IO operations and squash as many operations per IO. It, it doesn't have to be one IO operation per transaction. We, we can squash them all together. And um, now the, the complexity becomes that the, the complexity is abstracted by this notion of directory, which we have here. You can have a different directory for each of your indexes. We have already seen that every entity which is indexed can, can have its own index, or they can share indexes, depending on how you feel, or if you want to keep them separate. For example, if they are separate different languages, you probably want to separate them, or you might want to separate them just for sharding reasons. Now, the directory abstracts this. As we have seen in the previous demo, I have set a directory called RAM, store it in memory, but that's for testing only. Um, sorry, I'm going ahead. The, the other alternatives are, of course, store it in a file directory. So give me a path where I can store these things. And we have some directories which do quite some advanced tricks. So they can do like air sync, like replication between different nodes of your system. So the big catch of this index writing business is that the index, in its, ori in its very own nature, to be very efficient when you are writing, it has to be written by a single node at a time. So you have to collect changes from multiple application servers and forward them to one single application server, which is your master node. And this will flush all the changes on the index and copy them back on, on your other replicas. So the diagram I'm showing here is what we call like the asynchronous index updates over JMS. Or it can also work over J groups. We have these two different options. J groups. Uh, could be easier to set up in some cloud environments. JMS has optional transactional capabilities, so you have the, the, the two things. Uh, the performance, it's a strong fight. They're both extremely fast, so that's not the main uh, decision factor. But the problem of this scenario is uh, the uh, updates of the index ca cannot really be synchronous with your transaction. So if you have stored a new user and then you query for it, well, the, the update request might still be in the pipeline, or it might have been applied, but uh, you still don't have an updated replica of the index on your local node. So that's the catch of this configuration. But it get, this gets you really, really good throughput. And in most use cases, it's not a problem to not have an immediately synced up index. If we get back at the example of like Twitter, when somebody tweets and somebody else could not see that yet, that is not a problem. He, he will be able to see that 10 seconds later, and nobody notices. If you're having a store like Amazon, and they have a new product on their website, nobody cares if you're going to see that 10 minutes later than, than their thing. But if you need uh, real-time cluster synchronization, we have an option for that. The, it's, we can use Infinispan, which is the, uh, Infinispan is this other community project which we use in Wildfly for uh, like uh, real-time session replication or uh, cache for uh, Hibernate, so that it keeps the cache in sync across different nodes. So the, the very good news here is that you very likely have Infinispan already set up as part of your application server configuration. Because if you're running a cluster of application servers, they will be using Infinispan as part of their core replication infrastructure. And so we can store the indexes in there. That's uh, a nice option. And so to say a bit more, so wh what is Infinispan? And we have several other integrations with Lucene in the Infinispan world itself. i go very quickly about this. So at its core, it's a key value store on the Apache license. It's very scalable, and it supports transactions. So that's a bit of the unusual thing of uh, in-memory uh, key value store. It can uh, persist, so offload part of its content to uh, alternative systems. Uh, there is uh, actually a very long list. You can go from, some, from simple files and databases. You can go to like uh, Cassandra or MongoDB or other systems. Um, and of course, it's local or clustered. You can use it in embedded mode in your application, like Wildfly embeds in Finispan in the same JVM. Or you can set up a server to have a dedicated separate node, which is giving you these services and much more. But in the scope of Java Enterprise, uh, it also is the Jcache implementation that we created. And uh, yeah, as I mentioned, this, uh, it's a core component of the application server. Uh -huh. So how does it integrate with Lucene? 
we did the same kind of integration of indexing that we did for Hibernate. We took the same annotations and moved them into the Infinispan project. I mean, it's not copying them, but they, have, they are sharing the dependency. And so you can index using the same annotations we have seen before. You can index POJOs, which are actually storing in a replicated uh, or distributed key value store. So yeah, same uh, technology. And this is how it looks like in terms of dependencies, essentially. We broke down the Hibernate Search project in a Hibernate Search engine from a Hibernate Search uh, ORM component, which is the one which integrates with ORM. And there is this new project called Infinispan Query, which does the binding from the Infinispan, the data grid itself, and the engine. Both of them are very leaky abstractions of Lucene, and they allow you to run native Lucene queries on top of their distributed store. Just an example, this is, you see, the, the difference is it's not an entity. <laughs> but you can store this in, uh, in your distributed uh, grid. Now, the API of Infinispan looks like a map. So you would store the country in a map. And that's the storage. At this point, it's replicated, distributed, indexed, and all what, what needs to happen. I'm going to skim through this. Yeah, this is how you run a query. So let's say you want to match all documents. This is the simplest query that you have in Lucene. It will match everything. And you get a, a cache query by getting the search manager out of the cache. You pass it the Lucene uh, query itself. And from there on, you can get the results or the result size or the result list or an iterator on top of the results. The iterator can be lazily can fetch lazily the data out of the distributed store engine. Mm. And, oh, yeah, we expose so much of Lucene that we actually allow you to open an index reader on top of the index store itself. So an index reader is a very, very low level API of Lucene. You can basically, from this, you can look at uh, all the scoring factors which are stored in the index. You look at the the, the, the basic elements of the structure of the index. Well, if this is the latest version, the latest stable version in Finispan, so that's how you would take it. The, this is actually an Uber jar which contains all of the different uh, components of the Infinispan project, but you could just take, let's say, Infinispan query and you would have only the query sub subsystem. And to be quick, this is how you configure persistence programmatically. And this is where it gets interesting. So a cluster of Infinispan can be fully replicated, which means the same keys are replicated on all the nodes of the cluster. Or it can be distributed so that you have every key living on multiple nodes so that you have uh, high availability of your storage, but not on all the nodes. And the ratio is something that you configure. In this case, it's having a num um, number of owners, too. So depending on how many nodes you have, it will always have at least two replicas of each of the entries which you are storing. And well, it, by the way, Infinispan supports queries over the scene, but it also does uh, MapReduce index less queries. Like if you did not index some of your entries, you can still run a query on top of it. And it does Hadoop integration and Spark. I actually had to remove the coming. This Spark integration is already committed. It's, it's market experimental, but you can play with it. This is how you enable indexing in an Infinispan configuration. And an example of how to set the indexing options asynchronous from so that your, your put operations, your write operations in the grid are not slowed down by the indexing operations, because the grid might be very sensitive to, to, to latency in this case. Ah, but this is where we configure now the directory provider. Rather than storing it in memory, we want to store it in Infinispan itself. So here it becomes like a chicken and egg configuration that Infinispan starts and has some caches which, in we, where you store your own information in there, which gets indexed, and the index is stored in other caches in the same grid. That's very nice. But we also have an Infinispan index manager. If you pick this one, you don't have to set up the propagation between master nodes. It will, the, the grid will be able to handle its cluster and its failover and its election protocols automatically. So you, you don't have to have that. It will just uh, 
you know, it will just, everything will just work without you having to set up queues of configuration. So that brings us to this uh, Lucene directory. And uh, what are we working on now? This is re really the latest. So we had some Google Summer of Code students this year. So Google, uh, uh, every year has been sponsoring this project since at least five years now. They're very nice. We always get some brilliant students contributing some new components and things. So Martin Brown just implemented a new bus, which is, uh, so the triggering of what needs to be indexed is moved from the Hibernate event listeners, which are very rich. They, are, they go beyond what's uh, defined in the JPA specification. So in the case of Hibernate, we have all the listeners that we need to guarantee of full synchronization of all your changes in the database with, with the index, as long as you're not using native queries, of course. And his, is um, this project, which will be integrated now gradually in the Hibernate Search project itself, is having now an option to base it on uh, database triggers. So we will be able, from the Hibernate point of view, that's nice because we'll be able to intercept even changes that you make from a different tool or from native SQL queries we will, that will trigger again updates that will happen on the index outside of the world. But also, what's very nice, he worked on OpenJPA and Eclipse Link integrations. So, well, I work on the Hibernate team, but we really think that this Lucene technology needs to be embraced more widely in the Java enterprise world. And it just saddens me that when I heard that there are some other developers which are, you know, stuck in using OpenJPA for some reason, uh, maybe because they prefer it, but then they really want to use this technology as well. It's possible now with this, uh, this is still a bit experimental, but we are in the process of integrating this. This will be a separate module, and it will not require you to use the specific Hibernate or M implementation as, as JPA. It, it will work with Eclipse Link or OpenJPA as well. At least this is the tool which has been tested with, but actually it doesn't matter which implementation it's behind. So that was a very nice uh, contribution. And yeah. I have something to say about Elasticsearch and Apache Solar. I think everybody knows them. They have, they're very big in the market of uh, search engines. So what do they do differently than what we have seen so far? Well, they provide the same, exactly same, very powerful Lucene-based technology because both of these libraries are actually built on the Apache Lucene core. They are exposing it over very nice uh, REST APIs and have lots of tooling to monitor the distribution or replication of these Lucene indexes designed to work in the cloud. So what we're planning to do now is to not have the on only the option to store things in Lucene natively as embedded in your application, but also give you the option to say, okay, we're going to listen to changes that you're doing in your transactions at the database level, but we're going to keep in sync a solar deployment or an elastic search deployment. Uh, this is working progress. We already have an experiment of elastic search working, but it's not API complete. So it has some features working, some other features have uh, like a to-do comment in there. So you can help with that or you can start playing with the parts which are working. Mm. And finally, we have another Google Summer of Code student who worked this summer who has been working on tooling for Eclipse. So that will help you you know, having a, a quick look in the index. Normally, people would download Nuke, which is a tool to inspect the Lucene index. Or um, now we will have this embedded directly in Eclipse. We'll have a JBoss Force integration so that it will integrate in a wizard to connect every piece. And InfiniSpan is getting faster and faster at every release. We had just had a very nice idea to take advantage of the latest feature, which is going to improve indexing performance very beyond what, what we're having today. I was not dissatisfied with the performance now, but this is going much further. And finally, we're really lacking in configurations for the highly available uh, setup. And so we're working on those configurations now. If you want to see more, I will keep the, the roadmap updated, which is on the search.hibernate.org page. And uh, if you have suggestions, you can help me with shaping that further. That, that's all, and thank you very much for listening. Hmm. Hmm. Are there questions? Hmm. Any questions?